Once upon a time, there lived a mighty Earl, whose vision it was to create a fairy tale world. It would come to be known as Alton Towers, and from that day forth, people from every land would come to this place, this magical place. Alton Towers has become one of the biggest and best-loved theme parks in the world. Over two and a half million visitors each year travel from near and far to witness the magic for themselves. Let me take you on a tour through this place and through time so you can see for yourself why Alton Towers is one of the biggest, scariest, most thrilling and amazing places you're ever likely to visit. Are you ready? Are you sure? You have reached the point of no return. start our tour in a place that provokes awe amongst its visitors, the X Sector. Let us meet the beasts that inhabit X Sector. <laughs> Enterprise, which spins at speeds of up to 60 miles per hour. Submission, which hurls you into zero gravity. And, of course, the 55 meter drop into the yawning chasm that is oblivion. Oblivion is the villain, it's this strange machine. intimidating and, and sinister and you're dropping down into oblivion into this underground world.
train that went down that hole. Believe me, it was a scary experience. We originally came up with the theme of, of this sinister sort of secret weapon that in every James Bond film, you know, you'll be going through the jungle and then you come up against this barbed wire fence and a ploughed mine strip and then there's this high-tech kind of installation and what exactly are they doing in there and is it deep underground? And that was the sort of theme for Oblivion. Don't look down. The thing that defines Oblivion at Alton Towers is that drop the one you can see right behind me. It's absolutely vertical and it drops into the unknown. From the top, you can't see the bottom. So if you're on it for the first time, you just don't have a clue what's about to happen to you when you drop in that black hole. That is the worst bit. You're sitting there knowing that it's going to happen. It's like you're going to fall out, really. And he's looking down at this hole. Where are you going like that? And you think you're going to die. A black hole. You don't know what's going to happen. Um... <laughs> <laughs> it is fantastic. I can't really say it on camera. <laughs> it's slightly weightless. Don't look down. The secret of our success at Alton Towers is understanding that we are all entertainers here. And an entertainer has to have a thorough knowledge of what it is that, that, that tickles the funny bone of, of their audience. It's very fine. It's very fine. You think, where are we going? Where are we going? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, and then. Terror and happiness. <laughs> we use the tools of our trade in order to actually conjure up these emotions in people. So with oblivion, for example, it's 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 that, that trepidation, it's intimidation of what's it gonna be like going over the top. One of the key things uh, about oblivion and how they enhance the excitement a little bit more is they stop you just at the brim of the drop. And you don't know when you're gonna drop. They might keep you there for a second, two seconds, three seconds. And that just adds to that anticipation and excitement before it plummets into the ground. What sort of devious and cunning mind could conceive of such an evil beast? The process of ride design is a very long and involved business, but basically we have to first of all have a very deep, thorough understanding of our guests, and that is the most important thing. Once we've done that, we get an idea of the kind of attraction we want, then we have to decide whereabouts on the park it has to go, and this is probably the most complicated business. Well, the planners have always been insistent that um, things can't be seen from um, outside the park to get the the sort of roller coasters that people are looking for these days which are taller and faster than um, before it is difficult to um, to design them to give the thrill that the public are now looking for it's not easy designing a roller coaster for example which by definition has got to go up high uh, and putting it on this park such that it can't be seen that is why we go to enormous expense to actually dig the rides down into the ground so they don't go above treetop height. 
you know, we were quite secretive about what we were doing, but the few people in the, in the industry that heard what we were doing, they said, you must be mad, you must be mad, because the whole cost us as much as the rest of the ride put together. And, you know, in, in our industry, well, certainly in America, you spend 95% of your budget on some great big machine. The idea of actually spending 50% on your budget on just digging a hole seemed crazy to people. So the process of, of conceiving the ride such that we get planning consent for it is a very complicated business. Then the whole business of engineering it is, is the next stage, which is normally handed over to a specialist company, the company that we choose to manufacture the ride. Simultaneously, as, as, as this is maturing, the studios are starting to think of the way something's going to be styled, what it's going to look like, how it's going to be themed and decorated. The marketing people are thinking of logos and names and all the other things that will be involved in marketing and promoting and advertising the ride, what is the TV commercial and so on. The landscape people are starting to work out how it's going to be planted out. The merchandising people are starting to plan the souvenirs that are going to be sold, that are branded to the ride and so on. And gradually it all comes together and then it's opening day. Well, away we go. Will you ever be the same again once you have ridden on the most awesome ride of modern times? It's an extraordinary ride. The only place in the world that you can experience dropping from that height down into a hole in the ground which never looks big enough to contain you. I don't know how many dozens, if not hundreds of times I've ridden it, but I still think when I'm hanging over the edge, I'm not going to fit through that hole. We interrupt the proceedings to bring you an oblivion report. A few moments ago, we were informed that a ride car has disappeared. Ride car 2 began its descent and doesn't appear to have come out of the other side. What is baffling experts is that there is no crash scene. There is no car, there are no survivors. There is nothing. Come now, our journey has barely begun. We'll go to a street, quirky and fun. In Cred Street, the younger ones can tour on a boat through a magical land and see the joy of toys at first hand. There's fun to be had on the frog hopper and the carousel. Careful you don't come a cropper. There's plenty to eat while you continue to drive around the house that keeps the magic alive. The great house of Alton Towers today reminds those who come of a glorious era when these romantic Gothic spires were part of the most splendid dwelling in all the land. The good Earl John took into his employ the greatest architect of the day, Augustus Welby Pugin, the finest in the kingdom. He would cast his spells and conjure his grand designs. The Earl opened up his house to all, kings and queens, lords and ladies, and all those who came danced, dined and marvelled at this most magnificent palace. The great masses from every corner of the land arrived by the new invention of steam locomotive to the station at Alton, and the Earls brought novelties and entertainers from distant places to delight the great crowds. Ella, Zwieler and Lulu, the great high wire artists, performed high above the valley. Mademoiselle Henri astonished crowds with her death-defying feats. And Sante, the man with the iron head, wowed his adoring public with acts of amazing strength. 
They performed alongside great shows of horse leaping, band concerts, and fireworks spectaculars at the magnificent Grand Fates. The Earl himself brought people in his own carriages. And later, new motor vehicles, or charabangs, brought in crowds of eager trippers. The 19th Earl formed his own motor company called Tolbert, after the family name, and threw open his gates to the motor car. How fantastic a trip to Alton Towers could be for everyone, young and old alike. But dark times would follow, and this once proud house would fall into ruin and decay. The earls lost their fortunes, and the once great riches were stripped away. Yet now, we see, with works of restoration and renewal, people can once again glimpse the splendours of Alton Towers. But come, look, see for yourself, experience this magical and sometimes mysterious past through the phenomenon that is Hex. When a ride is new, everybody wants to ride it and therefore there will be waiting times. But we want to make the waiting experience to be as pleasant as it, as it possibly can be. People that don't really understand what Alton Towers was all about, and certainly thought that if the Shrewsbury's had a country house, it should be in Shropshire and not in Staffordshire, they suddenly discover that, that this place, a real family lived here. That, that there was a relevance, that people had to serve that family, and, and there were all sorts of tales and folklore that were associated with the house. If you can have a true um, legend, and then this is a true legend. It was on a cold autumn night in 1821 when the thunder of hooves signalled the return of the wealthy 15th Earl of Shrewsbury back to his home, Alton Towers. As the journey neared its end, a mysterious figure suddenly appeared in the road. The Earl impatiently demanded of the driver why the carriage had stopped. With palm outstretched, an old woman pleaded with the Earl for the charity of a coin. The Earl cruelly dismissed her and instructed his driver to head back to the towers. Scorned, the old woman screamed a curse for every branch of the old oak tree that fell. A member of the Earl's family would die. ferocious storm raged, and with one mighty bolt of lightning severed a single branch from the old oak tree. And true to the old woman's prophecy, a member of the Earl's family suddenly and mysteriously died. Shaken by this tragedy, the arrogant Earl ordered his servants that every remaining branch of the oak tree be chained up in an attempt to prevent further misfortune. The legend itself has been in the village for, for well, hundreds of years. It's a ghost story. It's the thing that, you know, They've got it wrong, it doesn't exist. You know, when we actually saw the trip, and, you know, it comes to the end of shock to actually see that, the, you know, the damn thing exists, and it's, and it's spooky. Here we are, this is it. I mean, this is a tree that's, that's chained up, and 
still here to this day. You won't get many locals climbing the steps. You certainly won't get many locals, you know, coming down here after dusk and, and going anywhere near that tree. This is where the, the, the witch or, or, or the gypsy, this is, you know, what would have made the curse. One question I get asked, you know, why doesn't the spell still work today, really? Well, the main reason for that is actually the family die out, another part of the family take over. So that's probably why, you know, we always said that's, that was the sort of end of the uh, spell, if you like. Don't know. One of the old marketing guys rung me up and said, do you know any ghost stories? So that, uh, then I just, I just mentioned to him about the the chained oak and the, 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 the spell and, and the rest is history, if you like, and they went on to make uh, X. Just as the old woman did to the Earl and his family nearly two centuries ago, Hex puts you in a spin. There appears no escape from the curse of the old oak tree. Watch out for any branch that may fall from the oak. Under the curse, it means one of you will die. The old woman could torture your family for decades. Do you believe the legend of the old oak tree? If you do, Spare a thought for the Earl. <laughs> we must move on, dear companions, to Ugland. Here we travel further back in time to a land inhabited by dinosaurs. There's a ton of fun to be had, swinging around at full tilt. Driving bumper cars in a wacky race. Or spinning around in a whirl. You can test your strength, your climbing ability, or your deadly aim. Or race against time in the Dino Derby. Keep your eyes peeled, though, or you might get splashed. Young ones can fly around in an ugg bug. Whilst the bone shaker jolts, bangs and crushes those who ride. But the Tyrannosaurus Rex amongst all the rides at Alton Towers is the world-famous Corkscrew. This mighty dinosaur was the first major roller coaster ever to be built at Alton Towers. Back then, in 1980, plans were afoot to turn the garden paradise of Alton Towers into a theme park to attract huge crowds. A man named John Broom had a dream, like the Earls before him. To make this place famous across the world once more, people told him it could not be done. But John Broom was a determined man. The inland leisure park is here to stay, and uh, it's only now being realised, fundamentally realised, that there is a tremendous market in this field. And I think we've proved at Alton Towers that um, 
this market is ripe for tapping even further. And Broom succeeded in dragging Alton Towers out of the prehistoric age into the modern era. John was at that time looking at theme parks to get ideas about how we could develop further uh, at Alton Towers. In 1979, he managed to persuade some financiers in Germany to finance the installation of the corkscrew. I went to ride a corkscrew in Holland. <laughs> They'd only just built it in the, in the factory yard um, at um, Bacoma. Um, it hadn't been painted, so it was all rusty and looking uh, rather terrible. Um, and we rode it, and um, the first time I went on it, um, we got to the top and I wondered what the hell I was doing up there before we, we shot off down. And it was quite a thrilling ride for those days. We started work to prepare the site for it um, three days before Christmas. We had Christmas Day off, but we worked all, uh, Boxing Day and all the way through um, and got it ready for opening um, just before Easter. We got uh, um, Nationwide, which is a programme on BBC, which actually put us on the map. And they were filming it with children from the school down in Cheadle. They had a dispatch rider waiting to take the film off down to London. Um, which it just got there just in time. So that went out to the whole of the UK and it was absolutely amazing the effect it had on us. We're now being pulled up to the highest point, some 85 feet, and within seconds these cars will be doing 65 miles an hour. Here we go. Right, sir. <laughs> don't, 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 don't close your eyes. Why? Keep them open. All the way. Oh, hey! Here we go. Whoa. The first drop is bad enough, and then comes the double corkscrew, which twice takes the cars through 360 degrees. But hair-raising as it is, most people seem to enjoy it, with reservations. What do you think? It was brilliant, but it's scary. <laughs> it's good when you go in the corkscrew, though. Yeah, it's very good when you go upside down. Really beautiful, but I think you only do it once. <laughs> the corkscrew was built by a Dutch company and cost one and a quarter million pounds. But according to the first day customers, at least, Alton Towers are on to a winner. On the bank holiday Monday, we had to close the gates because we had that many people trying to get here to, to, um, to see this corkscrew, this amazing piece of equipment that had been brought into the UK, first in the UK. Um, and they couldn't get, we, we just couldn't cope with them. There were too many people here. People were lying, you know, trying to climb over the fences and, and demanding to be let in. If one car left, another one be let in. It was unbelievable, you know, something like six to nine hour queue just for the corkscrew. I mean, the roads were completely blocked from uh, back to Derby, back to Stoke. The police were ringing up saying they shut the M6, they shut the M1. Um, we got uh, people with caravans that couldn't get in, coaches that couldn't get up the hills. Um, you got, you know, we, we sh I think we closed about one o'clock uh, and with an estimated 40,000 of people still outside. I know we, we went up from just under 500,000 people a year coming in during the late 70s to just over a million in 1980. So we, we doubled, more than doubled the numbers of people coming to the park just by putting the corkscrew in. Certainly, that was a major turning point when um, the corkscrew went in and it became the, really the first British theme park. It brought the um, leisure industry to the forefront in the UK and actually set the standards, and still does in my opinion, set the standards for um, this type of um, leisure development. <laughs> anticipation as you go over the edge. Starting up, then you get a nice view and then you go down crazy and it goes all horribly wrong. It gives you butterflies and you need to scream.
As a tribute to Alton Tower's success, the old earls would have been glad to see modern-day royalty visiting the towers once more, although acting a little oddly. They gathered here in the 1980s to play a charity game of It's a Knockout. Now, what are the ace cards that you're holding? Up? Well, we don't, we don't have any cards because basically we're the best. We're the best blue bandits there are. Okay? <laughs> From the strangely behaved royalty of then to the present, and another form of royalty, Rita, Queen of Speed. <laughs> Want to be accelerated from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in just a couple of seconds. Want to experience almost five times the force of gravity? Rita will take you there. This place is wicked! Let us leave, Rita, and move on again, my dear companions, from Ugland, across the great Garden Valley. Now you can take a cable car ride across the valley and marvel at these magnificent gardens, which have changed little since the time of the Earls. Then, a blind Welsh harpist was employed to serenade all who strolled this garden delight. The great vision of the Earls led them to create the first themed wonderland with representations of faraway lands, reflections of the Near East and the domes of the great conservatories. The Chinese temple and pagoda fountain hinted at the Far East. The statues and colonnades were Romanesque and classical. And, of course, European influences with the Swiss cottage. And Italian and Dutch gardens. The Earls were the first ever to create a pleasure land for all, for rich and poor alike. Visionaries indeed. We promenaded in great delight the wonders that feasted our eyes, until we came across Le Refuge, a place for repose and refreshment. And a magnificent vantage to survey the many marvels of the Earl's estate. But how does such a green and pleasant scene find its place in the 21st century world of roller coasters? It is all pure showmanship. Just imagine if he had had the technology that we've got nowadays, what would he have put down in the gardens? He'd have loved what, what we do. And what we do here, it takes it and it opens it up to the 21st century population and allows them to enjoy it. So it's highly relevant what we do. I think very simply, having the towers and the wonderful gardens makes us unique in terms of what we're offering these days. People love having the modern aspects of the rides, the entertainment, the hotels, but also it adds a certain class and style and heritage. Throughout the years, more and more people came to Alton Towers to walk amongst its many beautiful wonders. They arrived increasingly at the gates in their cars, filled with excitement. They would picnic, lounge, stroll, and enjoy the ever-evolving amusements, provided 
all for their delight. In the 1950s, Collins Fair arrived to bring a touch of the seaside to Alton Towers. Featuring helter-skelters, slides, swings and merry-go-rounds. But now again we must move on, this time in the old cable car and forward to the 21st century. Featuring rides offering a contrast of thrills, spills and emotions, many modern-day thrill-seekers spend their lives solely in Forbidden Valley. Some ride the blade, a pendulum which swings and sways. But for those who like their thrills just a little closer to the edge... There will always be a desire in people to be taken to the edge. John Wardley conceived Nemesis as one of the most exhilarating rides you will ever take in your life. From design to construction, it took almost three years. The question was, when it had been built, would it stand up to thrilling even him? Two years of planning, about 10 million pounds, and we're about to see if this thing flies. I think I know what to expect. But no one can really tell what's going to happen. We're in the hands of Sir Isaac Newton here. We're going up the lift. No brakes, nothing. Once we're over the crown of this lift, we just got gravity on our side. Lovely view. It's an amazing sensation. There's nothing beneath your feet. You're just hanging in space. It's... Oh, <laughs> wow. Here we go. Right, we're picking up speed, and we're about to enter the first inversion, the first barrel roll coming up now. Feet through the air. Wow. Now we're getting faster and faster through a helix and into a zero-G roll. Oh, wow. Three seconds of weightlessness, a stall turn. We're just stalling. And now down into a vertical loop, upside down, down into a tunnel. Wow. You really think your feet are going to crack against the rock? Now into another barrel roll, down and into another tunnel. Wow, and into the station. I invented this thing, and I'm supposed to be impervious to this kind of thing, but that was that was the most sensational thing I've ever done. And Nemesis has been thrilling millions ever since. They come to take the ride of their lives. Roller coasters peter out towards the end. This is the final part of Nemesis's track, and just look what's going to happen. And you nearly hit the ground yeah. so fast. Yeah, and your face pushes in. Yeah! Nemesis and not come up with a bad hair day, it just doesn't happen. 
fantastic. Really, really good. Yeah. You just don't know where you are on it. It's really disorientating. It's thrilling. With Nemesis, we take you around dangling in space. The next thing to do is to make you actually fly. Because there'd been stand-up roller coasters and there'd been roller coasters putting you in all sorts of weird positions. But really the ultimate was to fly like Superman. And the solution to getting people in that flying position of all bodily sizes short, tall, large, small, safely and quickly such that you could send them around the track was a, a, a gigantic technical challenge. People imagine that you're sort of going to have to sort of get yourself into some sort of harness that's up above you and strap yourself in and of course that, 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 that could never be done quickly and safely. The solution to sit you down and have these automatic things that adjust all around you. It's much more sophisticated than any other harness that had ever been developed. And then before the train leaves the station, turn you into that, into that, that flying position and stretch you out and have uh, various cushioned parts that automatically adjust themselves to the contours of your body was, was a pretty neat solution and we didn't want anyone to know about it until opening day. incredibly graceful if you watch it go around the track it is so smooth and the way that it twists and turns it's just it's, it's sort of so well engineered and designed every, every curve every dip is all in the right place feeling of being completely and utterly free with yourself because you just lay there and go with the flow of the track it's so graceful it's like a, it's like a bird it's like an albatross flying It's one thing flying through the air like a bird, but quite another hurtling through space hemmed in by metal bars towards the biggest jet of water you've ever seen. The water on Ripsaw adds to that ride experience because as well as the thrills of being upside down and going fast and the g-forces and so on, you also have that thrill of will you or will you not get drenched. You could get splashed, you could get completely and utterly soaked to the skin. So it adds to the excitement, the thrill and the anticipation of the ride. For some reason, plenty of people seem to like it. and the harness is locked, 
There's nothing you can do as you're going round and round and those fountains are getting nearer and nearer to your face. There's nowhere to go. You can't lean back out of it because you've got a headdress behind you. And there's nowhere you're going to go except getting wet. If Forbidden Valley has all the thrills, then nearby is a dark and sinister place which will give you the chills. It's a place full of ghosts, ghouls, apparitions, and the undead. Those who enter here do not always return. A controversial genetic surgeon has vanished leaving behind a legacy of unfinished research into the reanimation of the dead. People fear that this is just the beginning of something terrible. The forensic investigation has been stepped up within the grounds of Dr. Nicholas Rudin's home. Police confirm they have no further clues at this time. This is Richard O'Connor reporting live for ATNC. As this day draws to an end, the search for Dr. Nicholas Rudin continues. Do you consider Dr. Rudin's controversial experiments into the reanimation of the dead right or wrong? Do you decide on tonight's Do you really believe that zombies may be involved in the disappearance of Dr. Rudin? The undead have risen. A legion of zombies has emerged. Drawn to the home of their creator. and run, but you can't hide. Evil has spawned from the heart of this house. You must face your fears. Prepare to duel. The only way to escape is to saddle up and face these fiendish creatures. Duel your way free. Mind you, even when you've escaped the duel, you still may not be safe. Gloomy wood is not the only part of Alton Towers believed to be haunted. There's a guy that actually walks up the main gift shop steps. He's dressed in uh, top hat and tails. And he actually died on that. We know he died on the steps um, just going into X. He was actually coming back from a party in, in Farley Hall, about 1860, something along those lines, and too much to drink, I don't know, passed away on the steps. <laughs> I think it was 1989, I left the main entrance working on the kiosks and I went to work in the strong room, counting the money, counting the day's takings. And in one part of that building, several of us used to sit at tables where we actually physically counted the money. And you sat on a chair that was a bit like a typist's chair, so that it had a back which moved as you moved. And on several occasions, the back of the chair, for no reason, would thump you in the middle of the back, for no reason at all. I say thump you, thump me. The black hole is supposed to have been built on uh, a headless horsewoman uh, who, who comes up that way. And we had quite a, few, quite a few problems with the black hole when it was first put in. And they actually had exercise, they actually got a priest in there. Dennis Bagshaw, who was the boss there, was quite, you know, quite uh, heavily said, you know, it's definitely to do with the ghost, blah, blah, blah. And they actually had it exercised, and believe it or not, you know, we didn't have any further trouble. You never know who or what might be around the next corner. 
if a venture into gloomy wood whets your appetite, you might find you wet your pants. Water has always been a feature of Alton Towers, ever since the Earls laid out their original designs. And since then, it has been used in many different ways to entertain and enthrall visitors here. Whether it be simply admiring the view, diving, swimming, rowing or driving your own powerboat. Water at Alton Towers has kept people entranced for centuries. In the 60s and 70s, water kept other creatures happy. In this case, the performing sea lions. And there were those on the lakeside who would make a different sort of splash from the racing on the great motor days to the racy with scantily clad maidens in beauty parades. Today, water is used for many different things. And around the corner, in Katanga Canyon, water meets speed. Trains were a feature of the past also, when visitors rode around to view the wonders of the towers. And from trains to engines of a different variety. In storybook land, there are contrivances aplenty for the very young. The story goes on, as the magic gets stronger from without to within, with ever new devices to make your head spin. Spinball Wizard. You can 
can now even stay with the magic. And it's you go, make it a spin. You're making me... At the Alton Towers Hotel and Splash Landing. Where the time of your life can go on and on. And there we have it, my dear, dear friends. We now have journeyed to the end. But before you go, there's something you should know. Remember the Earl? Well, he is me. Come back to my world. More wonders to see. Hold on tight. tight.